first i think uh, i think you know we could uh, we could uh, start uh, uh, saying hello to everybody and thanks for joining us uh, to this uh, this webinar uh today we have a specific subject uh, dealing with uh, functional safety and uh, i will not read the long long uh, title we gave uh, i i leave to, to to tino to go through later uh, but we are touching a specific topic uh, of functional safety uh, dealing with architecture uh, and uh, safety and availability what happens if uh, failure happen uh, and what is the status of uh, safety and availability. But uh, before to do that and to go through, I would like uh, yeah, to, to thanks, to thanks uh, all the participants. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. I'm trying, yes, now to, to get control of the slide. Uh, short introduction from, from ourselves. Um, we have today Tino, our functional safety director with, uh, I think most of you, or if not all, uh, knows already Tino, as we are running this, uh, this, this webinar on different topics uh, uh, since a couple of years now. We started with the COVID and we decided to continue it. Uh, Tino has a wide experience in functional safety, um, providing uh, consultancies to the process industries, uh, as well, it is a well-known uh, uh, trainer uh, also, I had pleasure to arrange several training over the years uh, together with him. I know Tino since uh, more than 20 years. I think it is, we are running to 25 years right now. Myself is uh, Mauro Perego. I'm sales director at uh, GMI. I have more than 30 years, unfortunately, of experience in, uh, in the process industry. And in the last 20 years, focused on, on functional safety. So before to, to, to enter into the detail of the, the webinar, I would like to give just a very, very short introduction of uh, the company of GMI. Um, GMI is a, a company, Italian company located in uh, nearby Milano. And what we are doing, we are doing a, a field interface, a field interface, uh, which are um, focused uh, uh, on, on safety. So we deal with uh, the intrinsic safety and functional safety. So all, of, all our product uh, are uh, safety related. We are, we are, let me say, focusing our attention in uh, providing and reducing the risk uh, to have accident. Uh, we protect uh, human life, uh, assets, uh, environment, and so on. So you find our equipment uh, in most of the automation packet like uh, DCS, ESD, uh, HIPS, uh, burner management system, and in several industrial sectors like uh, oil and gas, chemical, petrochemical, including also pharmaceutical and food and beverage. So the company has uh, more than 40 years uh, of experience in, in, in functional safety and in intrinsic safety. We are Italian, we produce everything in Italy, but we are of course uh, present worldwide uh, with subsidiaries, uh, offices and partner. Uh, here just a short uh, uh, view of uh, what we are in terms of number with offices, uh, distributors, uh, uh, employees. And since we are talking today about functional safety, it's worth to mention that also we arrange uh, uh, per year um, something like 20 uh, training uh, all over the world, uh, whether they are in person, face to face, or whether they are um, online. Uh, later, we will talk about the training that we, we can provide and the kind of support we can provide to you customers. Um, yeah, again, few numbers about uh, GMI. Of course, uh, we produce with the state of art of technology. Uh, we test 100% uh, all our equipment and that's why we normally give uh, to our customer a five years warranty. We are so confident about the quality of our product that we provide five years warranty to, to, to our customers. Of course, being uh, uh, 
safety company, we have to fulfill uh, a lot of requirements in terms of certification and standard, uh, which deal with our the quality of our product. Uh, on the other hand, uh, since we deliver our goods uh, worldwide, uh, we have a full range of uh, regional certificates and certification which are demanded. So whenever you have a plant uh, uh, and whenever wherever it is the part of the world you need, uh, safety, we can uh, we can reach provider uh, uh, with our certificate. Uh, this is a short uh, page uh, with uh, with our portfolio. Uh, so what we do, uh, we do intrinsic safe barrier, we do safety relays, uh, we do isolators, we have power supply systems, we provide uh, multiplexer systems. Uh, as well, uh, termination board uh, customized for different uh, safety system or DCS system. We have heart multiplexer, surge protector, and loop indicator. The last bullet, it is not a product. Uh, it is the kind of support that we provide uh, together with, uh, with Tino, for example. So we provide consultancies uh, uh, mainly in the range of uh, intrinsic safety seal, as well as cyber security. All products you see here either are intrinsic safe uh, or it can be installed in a Zardus location or they are safety related or both of them. So if you have any topic with uh, safety, you can refer to GMI and we can provide you the support uh, which you may need. This is just a short list of typical customer that we have uh, ranging from system integrator, EPC, OEM, and end user. Of course, this is just a limited uh, list. And uh, that is promised. I have been short because I want to give uh, the speech to, to Tino to enter into the topic uh, of functional safety. Uh, just a few words uh, before to leave the speech uh, to Tino. Um, this is a recorded uh, uh, webinar. Uh, you will have the chance uh, later on uh, uh, to reach our YouTube channel where you can see this webinar and you can see as well all the other webinar that we are arranging periodically on different topics. Today is functional safety, but we have also a webinar related to intrinsic safety or specific application of our product. Uh, uh, so you can go through uh, the YouTube channel and you can have uh, you can have a look uh, on which topic is, is is of interest for you. Uh, very few words again, and then I promise to leave the speech to Tino. Uh, you will receive uh, um, an email uh, with a copy of these slides, so you will get that uh, the PDF. And during the webinar, I will monitor the question and answer. So if you have, and if you want to raise questions, uh, you can do that. Uh, I will monitor and I will interrupt uh, uh, whenever possible Tino to give you the reply. The last section of this webinar, it is a question and answer. So we collect uh, during the registration, uh, during your, your registration, we collect some few questions uh, and we will provide you answer uh, immediately after the, the webinar. That's all from my side. Uh, again, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, maybe I missed something, Tino. I'm sure you will uh, correct me. And uh, I will give this right now. Okay. okay. Thank you, Maro. And thank you, GMI or GM International, for giving us another opportunity to share some of our know how. I think we have to say before we start, it is remarkable. The more simpler we make topics, the more people are joining the webinar. It's very rare we see such a huge number of people all logging in to hear what is, according to my know-how today, still something of the core basics that, um, to my surprise, sometimes people in the training are asking me questions that I then start to figure out that people do not really understand the core basics. And that is why we told here today, let's make something simple or try to make it simple because... No matter how complex the topics are, it's always a matter of how can you bring it over into the audience as simple as possible. So let's give it a try. Topic we selected is about the architectural constraint and is about how do you degrade? Degrade means you come from something with more available channels to some less available channels. 
can be, for instance, from your transmitters, from your sensors. And if I look in the in the uh, in the field with the clients, typically sensors like transmitters will all be minimum a one out of two or a two out of three. And then when you would ask to the people, why would you select a two out of three above one out of two? Most of them would say, well, that's better for us because production people, they don't like to have spurious trips, etc. And that is all the topic for today. So I would like to give you some details, differences between safety availability. That means when do you select what number of channels to be more available for safety or and or when do you select another architecture for being also more available to keep your production running. And as you know, production running and trying to go to a safe state doesn't always go hand in hand. In other words, when you close a shutdown valve and the production is stopped, that means your production availability is gone. But you have achieved safety because potentially you could bring that element, that instrument into a safe state. Where and when do we need to know what the architecture is? I thought if I go back to the life cycle, which is the life cycle here of the 6.15.11, which we have different webinars concerning different topics on those life cycle activity phases, which we will not go too much in detail, but I've made for you a summary. And as you can see, I highlighted here four boxes. I highlighted here this box number three, which we call phase number three. That is where the engineering contractor typically will need to describe in a safety requirement specification how your final safety instrument function or your safety loop will have to be built. And then here in this phase number four, that is physically where a system integrator or where the uh, engineer that needs to build the loop will start to design and engineer the safety instrumented system or the SIS. And as you can see here, there are different references giving. You see here close 11, 12, and 13. Well, that close 11, that's chapter 11 from the part one of the SIG 1511. That is where they will explain you a lot more in detail about those architectural constraints. That's the main topic here for today. And then here in that uh, close number 12, or chapter 12, that is where you will have to have the opportunity if you're using a safety programmable PLC, where you can program your interlocks or your logic inside the PLC. And in that phase uh, four, close number 13, that is your factory acceptance test, which is like a partial validation. And then you ship everything on site, you do installation commissioning, you do your final validation, which is again your SAT, which is number 15 over here. That is where it comes interesting for the operating companies or for the end users that are listening in into this webinar, because you will have to operate and maintain your safety loops, enable to maintain your safety to whatever was the requirement in the design or was specified in your safety requirement specification. And eventually, we always come to the same point that nothing will last forever. There are always some reasons why you want to modify specific, some, let's say, architecture or maybe some instruments or maybe some devices. So you always have to deal here with the modification. And the architecture, again, is for me in this slide here, very important in the SRS, which is phase three, in design and engineering, which is phase four, for the ops and maintenance, which is phase number six, and for the uh, phase number seven, which is the modification. Uh, I'm just, uh, Maro, I just take your um, control away because I have my cursor moving a few times. Is that possible? Can I do this? Uh, let me see. Uh, withdraw the cohorts. Okay, good. So, this is what I just have explained on the life cycle boxes. You see here, when do you define it? Well, in phase number one, you do your process hazard risk analysis. Then potentially you also use a layer of protection analysis, which is called LOPA in phase number two. That means you will look on your existing layers, how much risk reduction can we actually achieve with the installation we already have. If that doesn't give you the sufficient 
or the necessary risk reduction, then you have to come up with a new additional risk reduction or a safety loop. That is where it gets specified here in phase number three. And that is the first time where the requirements will come up to say, what type of sill level do we like to achieve with that type of safety loop? And then I call this decide. That means you have to decide based on the available instruments that you can find on the market. You have to decide how you can use them in your design and engineering of that safety instrumented system. And especially here in phase number four, you will have to understand what is the difference between, as an example, road 1H versus road 2H. What is now prior use? What is now proven use? That is something that you will have to understand. And I made some slides for that. In other words, this hardware fault tolerance, which is named in the standard as HFT, will be guiding you how many instruments or devices do you need in able to achieve your SIL. That will be based on certain criteria. Again, I've made a slide for that. And then during the use and maintain, that means during the operator and maintenance, when an operator or a maintenance or an instrument engineer will have to do some maintenance or will have to use maybe start up the loop or stop the loop, etc. Well, you will have to know also specific and understand what architecture that loop will have enabled to keep either your plant safe and production available or to keep your plant safe and maybe stop your production. It will all depend on what type of configuration you have selected. Oops. That's here the table as a summary, which is coming out of our training course. And um, I'm just trying to move something here on my screen. So HFT is here on the top. I made here, I made here like a kind of a mind map where you can see you have three options. I call that a method, method number one, two, and three. The standard doesn't call it method. It's just me personally calling it method one on the left-hand side. That is based on road 1H. And in summary, that is the theory approach for any new vendor that wants to bring an instrument on the market. When the instrument is not on the market been yet, that means they have no evidence. They cannot prove how safe it will be. So someone will have to make a kind of an analysis. We call that then the famous FMEA or Feather Modern Effect Analysis. And based out of that, you will get some information. And also based on the type of instrument, if the device is now a type A or a type B, which are two different types described in the IEC 61508, then you can see here on the column, which you see here on the bottom, type A and type B, we call that table number two, that is type A. And for table number three, which is type number B, you see here we have here a zero, one, and two hardware fault tolerance. And again, I will use this zero, one, two as my guidance to prove or to show how many do I need in able to achieve a certain cell criteria. On the left column here, what is known by road 1H, that is this safe failure fraction. That's a quantity of a ratio of percentage, how many danger failures are hidden away in your equipment. If you go to method number two and three, you see here road to H on method number two, which is also mentioned road to H here, which is method number three. So staying in the middle on method number two, that is for the vendors, that can actually start to prove proven in use. And proven in use will mean they can prove that their equipment in a specific environment with specific data collection of quality feedback of failure data, they can prove how safe such an element or instrument can be used. We call that here simply proven in use. And then for the 6.15.11, so in the US, we, we call this the ISA 61511 since 2018. In Europe, we call it the IEC 61511 since 2004. And in the States, it was called 84.01, but now they adopted the same number as we use with the IEC standard. With method number three, that's all based on prior use from the end user facility plant experience 
feedback fed data itself. In other words, it's the end user that needs to collect data based on their experience, based on their environments, based on the use or maybe the abuse of an equipment. On that experience, that further data is needed in able to claim here the prior use. I will not go too much in all the requirements and details because again, that's either part of our training course or part of other webinars, but both method two and three can go simply here to table number six. We call this here table number six, which is coming from the 61511. And as you can see here on the left column, the first question that the table six will ask you, what level of SIL do you try to achieve? Do you want to achieve and comply to SIL one? Do you want to achieve to SIL two or comply to SIL two? Or do you maybe want to comply to a SIL three? And as you can see here, a SIL three is for any mode. That means it can be for a low demand for a high demand or for a continuous mode, that is where you will be asked and required to install an HFT of one. That means you need to be able to tolerate one danger feather in your architecture or in your equipment or devices or instruments. When we go to SIL2, that is the only difference with SIL2 for a low demand mode, that means when your equipment under control, in other words, your process unit will demand based on a hazard happening, will demand a safety loop to go to a safe state no more than once per year, we call that a low demand. Opposite, when it is more than once per year, we call this a high demand and or here the continuous mode. That is where you still require a HFT of one. But as you can see clearly, the guidance from the 61511 is giving that for a SIL1, any mode, and for a SIL2, low demand mode, they allow you to work with an HFT of zero. That means single devices, which mean a one out of one configuration. Of course, there's always a but. I'm just trying to control my screen again. So that wrote one eight or method number one, I call that the theory approach that is purely based on someone that has made an assessment on the equipment to prove with some data how safe or unsafe that equipment could be. And the other one, method number two, is purely based on field quality feedback data. But the question will be, for all those who are listening in today here in this webinar, who of you have quality feedback data from your installation with your proof test regime, with your proof test quality coverage, et cetera. Who of you have data that can prove that? And that's the prior use or that's the proven in use because we cannot point the finger to a manufacturer not having good data when you are not giving the data back as an end user to the manufacturer. In other words, if the units are getting replaced, but instead of sending them back because they were failing or they were not working anymore and they are not in warranty and you throw them away, well, that means the manufacturer has no idea that your unit has failed because you forgot to tell them. So that's here the quality feedback data, which is the main condition in able to be allowed to use this table number six. Right, I'm just looking at my clock. I've been talking maybe too slow already, Mauro. I was trying to explain it as simple as possible. Right, so HFT here on the left, we have here zero, one, and two. I will go a little bit faster now. In the middle here, that is the minimum architecture to achieve this HFT if you purely want to focus and only focus on safety availability. That means a HFT of zero can indeed be built with a one out of one, but it also means it is not really available for safety because one danger feather in that type of instrument and it will not be able to go to safe position anymore. If they require an HFT of one, that is a one out of two. If they require an HFT of two, that's a one out of three. If on top of your safety availability, you also want to increase and try to maintain your production availability, that is where you will go to a two out of two or to a two out of three or to a two out of four. Architecture in both standards is being expressed as M out of N. 
M stands for the independent voting channels, whereas N stands for the redundant channels available to achieve the same safety or part of the same safety. And I give a very quick example, which is also coming from maybe another webinar which we have done. On the left hand side here, you see a reactor with an inlet, a pipeline, two valves, both are potentially fell close. In other words, closing is isolating the stream of the inlet of the reactor. When I configure two valves, on one pipe and they are both fell too close, we call this a one out of two. That's a great story for the safety engineer because if either one of the two valves has a failure and is maybe stuck open and you can still close the other one, that's a great story to have safety availability because you can still, with an HFT of one, you can still achieve safety by closing the other one. That's the worst nightmare for the production people because they do know if one of the two valves for some reason, has a spurious strip, a nuisance strip is closing for no reason, they will lose production and they will get very nervous and they will put the pressure on the instrument engineer to go and repair this yesterday. In other words, as fast as possible because they don't make production. On the right hand side, it's just the opposite story. We have two valves in a drain function. Both valves are fell open. That means, why do we put a second valve here? Assume that this content of this reactor is a very expensive product. If I only would have one valve and the valve starts to leak, I would actually start to lose my production and I would actually be in trouble from the production people saying that, why is this valve leaking and we cannot maintain our production? So we put a second valve here. We have two valves, but we need two. That means we have no safety redundancy. And if one valve would be stuck close, I cannot drain anymore. Right, Mauro, we have the first quick question. Yes, but uh, somehow I lost the control and I'm not able to... Ah, it's maybe my mistake. I was maybe too ambitious. Let me try to do this again, Mauro. Sorry for that. No problem, no problem. Hey, Co-host, all right, here, here you go. Yes, now I can uh, I can uh, launch uh, the <clears throat> the question to the to the to the people. Right. Here. Uh, let me the question quickly: safety availability versus production availability. So we heard with this two react with this reactor inlet and reactor outlet. What was the difference? That is here now trying to recapitulate on that slide, which was just a slide before. Safety availability versus production availability. First answer number one. Safety availability versus production availability. Um, one out of two and two out of three are the same for production availability. That is the first answer A. Answer B, a one out of two is better for safety availability than a two out of three. That is answer number B. Answer number C, a two out of three uh, provides, let me just, I cannot just read it, provides both safety and production availability. That is answer number C. Answer number D is two out of two and two out of three provides the same safety and production availability. And the last one, E, two out of two, two out of three, two out of four, all architects provide the maximum safety and production availability. Which one do you believe is the most correct and the most complete answer? And only one is, the, of course, the most correct and the most complete one. We still need a few more clicks. So uh, a few of you have to wake up. Yeah and click on the button. There's no price to win. There's no money to lose. There is no face to lose because we will not be silly and say who has made a mistake in the answers. We just want to test your know-how. Okay, I think uh, we reached a considerable, considerable yes. amount of answers. Uh, I can stop mm -hmm. and share the result that you can comment as well. Okay. okay, right. So uh, the majority of you have selected, which was answer number C, a two out of three provide both safety and production availability. And that is indeed happy to say, of course, the most correct and the most complete answer. A one out of two and a two out of three from a safety point of view, that was answer number B. And there were a few people selecting that. That is not correct. While a one out of two and a two out of three have the same hardware fault tolerance of so from a safety point of view, they have the same HFT. 
A answer number A had also one person selected, one out of two, two of three are the same for production availability. Of course not. That's the whole topic, what we try to highlight here in this webinar. So don't worry. I hope that in the next 10 minutes, it will be more clear. And then the last one that was selected by two people was two out of two and two out of three provide the same safety and production availability. That is also not correct. They do have the same production availability, but they have a different safety availability. Right, I stop sharing and I will show you now some highlights. The entire IEC 61508 and 61511 is always mentioning HFT, which stands for hardware fault tolerance. I make here between brackets in the red color. Basically, HFT from the standard is nothing more than asking the question how many danger failures can your architecture tolerate? and keep your safety function operational enabled to go to a safe state. So I call this a D for dangers, and I made it red because typically danger uh, is a, a red color in our training courses. And the second bullet is nothing to do with the IEC. This is my own, this is my own initial here, TVC. I have defined a new definitions many, many, many years ago where I tried to distinguish between the hardware fall tolerance dangerous from the standard with what the production people, production managements typically would prefer, which we call the HFTS, how many spinny strips can you tolerate and keep your production running? Because that is what the production people mainly are focusing on. They want to keep the production running and not be vulnerable for a spinny strip. So if I would summarize this into a table, which again, is also coming out of one of the training courses. You see here on the left-hand side, the most common architectures that you may have come across. And I'm pretty sure that most of you have seen a one of one, a two out of two maybe, or a one out of two on the sensors a lot, and a two out of three also on the sensors a lot. Maybe not many of you listening today have ever seen a one out of three or a two out of four. But if you would look at the voting of those left column architectures, the voting, which is here the V for voting, well, you can see that this architecture, that's the first letter or the first number of this architecture will represent always your... The second column, the R, stands for redundancy. Maro, I will just uh, put your microphone quickly on mute because there's some noise coming. Oh, okay. I put it. It's okay. So redundancy, which is here the second column, redundancy is the last number of your architecture, which is typically always the last number, except, that's the exception here, when your voting number one is equal to your redundancy number one, there is no safety redundancy. So summary, when voting number, oops, when voting number is equal to your redundancy number, your redundancy becomes zero. That is what we show over here. Otherwise, it is the last number. And as you can see, your redundancy minus your voting. So when you take here two minus one, that gives you the HFT of one. So your hardware fault tolerance of one means you need to have a minimum one out of two. And why would an engineer or a end user obtain or prefer to go to a two out of three? Because you can see here the difference. It's a not in the hardware fault tolerance dangerous, it sits him here in the spirit strip. So a two out of three can simultaneously can tolerate one danger failure and one safe failure at the same time. As you can see here, a two out of two can only tolerate the spirit strip, but both a one out of one or a two out of two can never tolerate a danger failure. A one out of two and a two out of three can both tolerate one danger failure with the difference that a one of two will and can have a spirit strip, it cannot tolerate a spirit strip, whereas a two out of three can tolerate also a spirit strip. And here we have the maximum here, we have a one out of three with a two and a two out of four. Both can tolerate two danger failures, but the difference lays them here that the one out of three can again have a spirit strip. And if you look in the right hand column, which was my own definition of HFT spirit strip, when you take your voting minus one, that is how you will come to that number over here. 
I want to give you two practical examples. I will do a forward of the, the next slide. I give you the two out of three, but first I will give you the one out of two. And the principle will be based on the, on the so-called fail-safe design. That means if it fails, it has to be able to go to a safe state. Zero means safety. One means production availability. And I've used for this two contexts, which has been symbolized here as A and B, normally open contact. That means in normal conditions, everything is open. There is no power. Even when the battery and the lamp would be in a good condition and you close those contacts, that is where you go to the second picture here in the middle. That is if you close both contacts, you will power up this loop and the loop will have this production running. Enable to open it, we have to open one or the other one or both. That means it doesn't matter which one we open, at least one out of two needs to go open to go to safety. That architecture will be chosen enable to tolerate, assume that B, the second contact is dangerous, closed, it cannot open anymore, and you can still open A, well, then you can still shut down your safety loop. However, as we show here, HFT of S is equal to zero. If A would go open for no reason, you will lose your production. So summary, a one out of two can tolerate one dangerous, but can never tolerate a spurious trip. I have done the same principle with a two out of three. Condition is you have two A contacts together. They work together, so they both go open or close together. You have two Bs together, and you have here two C contacts together. In normal condition, all is closed, so lamp is running, production is running. If, for instance, we say here we can tolerate one spinning strip, assume that B, in this case, goes open, and at the same time, we have a danger failure here. We can tolerate one danger failure. And we made here contact A dangerous. This means A cannot go open. And B is going open for no reason. As long as C is still working normal, you keep your plan running with internally one danger failure, which is the A over here, and one spinning strip, which was the B over here. So enable to stop the production, I need to have two contacts open out of three, enable to stop my production safely. Summary, if you compare that, the left column here, that's purely a binary column. I got here A and B contacts. And as you can see here, yellow represent zero or represent your trip condition signal. And one is the healthy signal. That means that there is no trip condition. You are in production. If I go first to the one out of two, and you look at the left column over here, you will recognize wherever you see a zero or both zeros, you will shut down your production. Enable to keep your production running. You need to be able to close both contacts and keep both signals healthy. If one of the contacts goes unhealthy or goes to a trip condition, you will shut down. If you look at the two out of three, I've done the same principle. You see here, we have here A, B, C, we have three contacts. That means you have eight different combinations. In a one out of two, you have four different combinations. The question would be, if you do a factory acceptance test, how many combinations do you test when you are testing three transmitters as three analog inputs into your voting block? And the correct answer would be that all those different eight conditions will need to be tested in able to have the maximum combinations of states of your input channels A, B, and C. And again, the same story over here. Since we are requiring two zeros out of three channels, wherever you will count two yellow zeros, you will see a shutdown. So we have four combinations of shutdown, and we have four combinations on keeping the production running. And you can see, although we have only one channel tripped in C, oops, in C, or in B, or in A, we can still maintain the production running, whereas compared to a one out of two, if one of the channels was a zero, you would generate a shutdown. So in other words, 
Here we have achieved a two out of three. If both zeros are coming in, we go to shutdown. Even have a third one as a trip signal, we will still go to a shutdown uh, in our installation. I see a quick question. Please, will you be sharing the slides of the training? That was what Maro was saying. We do share the slides into a PDF. Yes, Maro. Yes, yes, confirm. You will receive an email with the PDF uh, of the of this webinar. Uh, now we have another another poll question. I launch it. Yeah, and this and this question will actually be answered in the next coming slide. So before I show you the answer, I want to check if some of you would understand how can you actually in reality in the field go and do some maintenance on one of the three sensors. So you have a two out of three voting block. You have to go and calibrate maybe a transmitter or maybe you have to go and repair it. How do you bypass one of such a channel on a two out of three voting block? And I never really thought about that until a client recently in my training was actually simply saying with them, they actually mask or they disable one of the inputs and they do that in able to do the maintenance or the repair or whatever of this broken channel. And I asked him, how do you degrade the block? And he was looking at me, he said, no, we only mask the input. And I said, well, I think you're missing some points. So my question is here, if you bypass a channel on a two out of three, it can always be done by simply disabling one input channel. That is the first answer. And I already give this away. So that's certainly not the correct one. B, can only be done after compensating measures are in place and degrading to a one out of two for a time-limited operation. C, cannot take place while the process needs the safety protection on a live production facility. That means you not go to shutdown. You want to keep the production running. And we say it cannot take place then. D, can be solved via two redundant one out of two solutions and answer E is none of the above. Okay, we, we wait a few clicks again. Yeah, give us a few more clicks. Yes. And you see that people click almost everything. This is, okay. uh, which is scary. That's why. <laughs> That's why I'm happy that GMI is still investing in doing some webinars. Okay, I think now we can uh, stop the... Yeah, you can stop and can share. I'm happy yes, to say that the, that the majority did select, of course, the correct one. There's a very specific requirement in 615.11 saying that you are allowed to bypass as long as you have some compensating measures. What does that mean, compensating measures? Well, as the word in English is saying, whatever you lost, you have to compensate for it. But the specific question here is all to do with this famous function block called two out of three. How does the block degrade? Because if it degrades in a wrong fashion, it may degrade into a two out of two. So the only correct answer was here in this case was answer number B. Answer number A, well, can always be done by simply disabling one input channel. Well, I certainly would urge this engineer to look several times to this webinar and understand the basics because that's certainly not correct. If you have this ID, maybe you clicked on the wrong button, hopefully. Answer C, cannot take place while the process needs the safety protection on a live production facility. Would be great if this would be true. Unfortunately, this is not true because many operations cannot shut down because maybe there is some maintenance that needs to be done. And they want, of course, to keep the production running. So you will have to come up with a certain method. That is also what the standard will say. You are allowed to bypass as long you can guarantee that you can go to the safe state. And as long that you will have some compensating measures in place. And the last one can be solved via two redundant one out of two solutions. Well, again, it all depends on how you will configure your PLC, but typically this is not possible also. All right, I will stop sharing and I will give you now the answer. Yeah, assume there that is a question. there's a question. Do you require compensating measures if it is degraded to a one out of two, given that the HFT hasn't changed? The answer is yes. 
because your HFT has maybe not changed, but your safety availability, if you would look at your probability to fail dangers upon demand, reliability calculation on your loop is starting to degrade into a less available uh, arch architecture. So also there, we never bypass anything without a compensating measure. Now, if I go back into the function block, and I'm now being uh, into the binary coding again of a uh, function block itself, assume that I would, oops, I was hoping to see something here. Uh, maybe it's coming on my summary slide, sorry. I was thinking that there would be some red sign. Assume that here you would disable one of the inputs and the input, you would disable it into a healthy state. And I look here at the C channel because here I've got four ones below each other. If I would simulate this one, then your block here will only shut down if you go to two zero. So in other words, it's only correct if you mask or disable your one input channel if the internal of the function block will actually move from this functionality into this functionality, which is then a one out of two. Otherwise, you can see the difference. If you look here at B0 on condition line number six, and I see here on condition line number seven, we have also zero over here, which could be the same as line number two and number three over here. Here you generate a shutdown. But here you don't generate a shutdown since the block is still waiting until the second one will come in. So in other words, this block becomes here a two out of two functionality if you look into this configuration. And that is what I made over here. And I was thinking that I had the slides already. So what I just explained, that's here a two out of two, both zero before the shutdown. That's also true, both zero before the shutdown, if you would simply mask this into a one. And that was the picture I was expecting to see on the previous slide. So assume that you mask only here the C channel. Well, then your block, if you don't do anything on the internal degradation of the block functionality, you will become a two out of two. That means production will not care because they still maintain their production. But from a safety point of view, you have changed the architecture and you're no longer in a HFT fashion equal to one. Conclusion, the only correct method to bypass one input channel on a two out of three voting structure is to degrade from a two out of three into a clear one out of two. However, you need to have some compensating measures in place and it needs to be time limited. In other words, a bypass cannot be on forever. A bypass is a limited time. You need to take credit for this time because you are changing your availability as this open question came in from this one engineer. You are changing your availability of this two out of three architecture to go into a one of two. And that time limitation needs to be taken credit for into your availability uh, prediction. Summary, make sure that you understand first the basics. Select your correct architecture based on the IEC 615.11 and or the IEC 615.08. That was this method one, two, three in the previous slides. Truly understand the difference. When are you safety available versus when are you or when is your architecture production available? Respect the bypass requirements from the IEC 615.11. In other words, with the compensating and with the time limited condition and keep it functional safe. And I think probably one of the most sensible items here to give away today is think twice before you act. Because sometimes people think they understand until you start to analyze what they have done. So we can support you with the SIL manual and I will give then the word back to uh, Mauro as we have collected some uh, questions on the registration already. So we can support you with the SIL manual fourth edition, where there is a specific chapter called chapter seven and chapter eight, which I have been the author from uh, doing chapter 76, 15, 11 executive summary. The chapter eight was the safety requirements specification. We also have an online uh, GMI ac academy where we have all the changes from the edition two towards edition one. We have several topics very similar to what we have as a webinars, as Maro was mentioning 
We do also have all the webinars pre-recorded on the YouTube channel. We do still provide you with the TOV Rheinland upgraded competency review on your personal name-based courses for functional safety engineer, for cybersecurity fundamentals, and for cybersecurity risk assessment. Those are the three courses under the TOV umbrella. We also do, of course, customized in-house training, and we will have some more webinars to follow. As Mara was also mentioning, besides this, we also provide you with consultancy services on the 6511 and on the 62443. Mara, I leave the word to you and you can go into the, uh, let me stop sharing this. Do you share the Q&A or should I share it here? Oh, your microphone is maybe switched off, Maru. I can see your lips moving. Okay, yeah. just if you if you can open, I would uh, then. I share, uh, no problem. I share the screen, uh, which is the Q and A over here. In the meantime, there is a question which I will read. I give you the slide. Share. Start this one. The question is: about performing maintenance on one channel without applying a bypass such that you now have one channel voted to trip. Well, how will you do maintenance on a one channel? Omar is requesting, okay, approve, sorry. Um, how, uh, so how would you bypass a one out of one channel without tripping? In other words, if you would override an input, you have no safety availability anymore unless you will remove the input condition. So how can you compensate if you have to override a one out of one? Maybe you have a different way to compensate. So everything is possible, but you have to be able to prove how efficient or adequate will be your compensating measures before you can do that. And the question he wrote extra, this is for a two out of three architecture. Okay, so how about, I'll, I'll repeat your question because now I'm a bit confused as usual. How about performing maintenance on one channel without applying a bypass such that you now have one channel voted to trip? Ah, I think I understand now the question better. How about if you would remove the channel and you go to a zero, okay? That means you will do some maintenance on that. And if a second channel comes in, because that is what you say for two out of three, then indeed you will trip. Well, from a safety point of view, I would like that. I would love that. I would support that. But I'm pretty sure your production people will not be very impressed if you would do that. Because if you remove one input, that means there is already one condition tripped. Only one trip extra that comes in, which may be spurious, and you're out of business. So I don't think this would be a, let's say, a beneficial way to maintain production availability. And again, your production people most likely would not be very impressed. Right, Maro, let's go on to the next one. Yes, the next one now we have, uh, <clears throat> as mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have a section with the question and answer. We collected five questions, so we can go through one after the other. Okay. This so, is the first one, I leave you okay. reading that, so, Martino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a one out of two D that stands for diagnostic high availability voting degrading to a one out of one in case of a diagnostic fault in one of them, a good cost alternative to a two out of three. So when I was reading this, this question, again, of course, you cannot start to uh, communicate with the person and start to open a discussion. So you just have to make a snapshot of the question and trying to give you a valid answer or a sensible answer. Well, the first question for me that would raise is that what is your diagnostic coverage that you are claiming here in this architecture one out of two D? Because the D for diagnostics is typically coming from the manufacturer. That means it needs to be built in. And if then in case of a diagnosed failure to a certain percentage of diagnostic coverage, then that diagnostic decision will have to do something. It will have to, if it detects a danger failure, it will have to bring this situation into a certain safe story again. 
In other words, if you go from a one out of two and you would degrade into a one out of one, my question would be, why did the manufacturer install the diagnostics in a one out of two, most likely, and I think that that will be the answer here, most likely to achieve a certain sill level with the architecture of that device. And unable to achieve that sill level, he had to go into a, let's say, redundant fashion into a one out of two with on top of it some diagnostics in able to achieve a certain diagnostic coverage to claim a certain sill compatibility. But if he would degrade with that same instrument, most likely into a one out of one, I bet you money that most likely his sill compliance criteria will no longer be valid. In other words, if you can have a one out of two D and you degrade into a one out of one and they will claim the same SIL compliance to the standard, I would really like to see the report to understand what this question is based on. But that is the best answer I can give you to stay as neutral as possible. It cannot be for me, as I said here in the second bullet, in the case of a one of one, that this could be an alternative to a two out of three for safety. As we have just shown you the HFT tables, which I will not go any more into details now. Right, second question. Architectural constraints as per the 615, um, I think that should be 615.11 and not 60511. I think that's probably a typo. Either it was in the question, or did it cut, copy, paste? I didn't even notice because I saw 6511 in my mind. So I answered the question based on valid IEC 61511. As the 60511, I still think needs to be invented, doesn't exist today. Anyhow, see it also the 60511. Again, I did not notice. I copied the question as a title and I just give my answer based on the 61511, of course. Table six, which was the one over here, is very clear. Assume that you want to achieve a sill tree, which is the one over here on the second bottom row uh, on the table. A sill tree for any mode of, let's say, operations, low demand, high demand, continuous mode, always requires an HFT of one. So you need to have a minimum HFT of one, so you can only achieve this with a one out of two or a two out of three. In case you selected a one out of two instrument device configuration and one is failing, you are degrading from a one out of two into a one out of one. That means you are losing here your HFT. In other words, you no longer fulfill the requirements from the standard to achieve a SIL tree since you cannot prove that you have a heart level tolerance equal to one. In the meantime, I've got some more questions which I will keep for the, for the last. What are the benefits and disadvantages for both safety availability and process availability? Well, I hope this was answered, but I made here again a summary. As just shown in the webinar, a two out of three, that's the maximum. You have both a spurious strip tolerance and a dangerous uh, fault tolerance. So it's good for both safety and process. That's my summary. A one of two is only good for safety as you can tolerate one dangerous, but no spurious. So the production people will hate this because they don't like to trip the plant, not necessarily uh, correct. A two out of two is a great story for production availability because they can tolerate the spirit trip, but they can never tolerate the danger. So that's the nightmare for the safety engineer. And the last one, a one of one, that is the, uh, that's the nightmare for everyone, except if people are only after a cheap solution, well then stay with a one of one. Because a one of one cannot tolerate a spurious trip and cannot tolerate a danger failure. Would love to discover the SIL applications and also two out of three logic degradation and the implementation of redundancy and safe and fault tolerant. It was a long question. So I hope it was solved or it was answered in the webinar. But here is again, yet again, uh, the same summary, but all together in one slide. So that's maybe clear or hopefully clear to answer this question here. The left column here was explained on safety availability and on production availability. Those are the configurations. That's the first answer you will have to ask to your, let's say, production people, to the end user, to the client saying, what do you want? 
Do you want to have only safety availability or do you also would like to have safety and production availability? Because here the HFT 0, 1, and 2 is then used in table 6 on the top column over here and is used in table 2 and 3 in this middle over here, 0, 1, and 2. And if it is a table 6 or it is a method 2 and 3, which means quality feedback data, road to 8, which is the proven use on the SIG 1508 or prior use on the SIG 1511, then you can stay on this column to select your architecture. Or if it is based on the vendor information giving data or certificates or data sheets, then it will be based on a safe value fraction, based on a type A or type B uh, equipment. You check which cell you would like to achieve, and the, the, the top uh, column here will show you you require an HFT of zero, of one, or of two. So the zero, one, and two, and this zero, one, and two are all the same. And that's all the same here with the left column, which is here in the middle of this slide. Right. Let me first read these other questions quickly, Maru, if I'm still allowed. What is the time? Oh, I'm nearly there. Yeah, we, we went a little bit over, but please um, have a look. If using, that is an, uh, a person with no name, so if the no namer here, if using an ETT, there's probably energized to trip based on a two out of three battery system. If one battery is not available, should we do shutdown as a system is degraded and there is no battery redundancy? That's a complete different topic since ETT, energized to trip, is not fail safe principle. And here you have a different architecture. I assume your question has to do with the availability of your equipment. And I wonder, I really wonder now, on an energized to trip, that means you need energy to perform your activity. Why would you go to a two out of three battery system? I don't know, Maro, I'm a bit puzzled here. Let's, let's assume you have three power supplies. And you assume that you say here, to energize to do something, we select two of those power unit converters needs to be available, why would you then go for three to increase your availability? It would more be sensible for me if you would say, look, we have three power supplies. We do load sharing between each other and the certain power we need will be provided with the modular power supply units we have available. But I doubt that you would call this a two out of three. I, I think I need some more information really to give you a sensible or a decent answer, but that is what I would be my first reaction when I read this. And then why can we not use a one out of two D for safety? I did not say you cannot use it. I just said, based on the question that was asked by one of the uh, participants, I was saying that if you degrade from a one out of two D and you have a fair, I'll give you an example. I have an old PLC in my mind. I will not mention the brand or the vendor, but they were having one CPU module. Let's assume my hand is one CPU module. And on this one CPU module are two chips, two microchips with some diagnostics on top of it. That means this one module is for you one CPU. It's a one out of one. The internal kitchen is built with two chips, A and B. And they put some diagnostics on top of that. So the vendor will call this a one out of two D. However, if one of the two chips has a failure, they cannot maintain running on this one CPU board with the other chip healthy as they have no comparison anymore. That means they will have to shut down this one out of one module into a zero module in case of an internal failure. So a one out of two D internally from a manufacturer, you cannot do anything with that other than using it to a certain performance. But when there is an internal failure, based again on what type of failure, based again on what type of diagnostic coverage, that module will have to go into a specific state. Right, Maro, I will stop. Otherwise, good. Yeah, we have no open question uh, again. We have a very, very last uh, question, uh, which we would like to receive your feedback. 
hopefully this is positive uh, uh, also because even we were running out of time uh, we have been able to keep all seated listening to to you tino so i guess it was a good performance so give us some few feedbacks this is a very easy question and we need to to have your feedback in order also to yeah to to fine tuning uh, our next uh, trainings so i think we can uh, we can stop it here we receive a lot of good answer i just want to share with all of you again nothing else from from our side no no further questions but uh, as mentioned you will receive the email with the pdf uh, of the presentation you have there our contact and if you need any further information you can follow up on our website uh, you can check which other uh, webinars on functional safety on intrinsic safety or any other topic you may are interested in uh, following up thank you very much again thank you tino thank you Maro. and uh, look forward to to see you all again and um, hopefully in person maybe in future now there is this new trend over the web but which is very very good i believe uh, we are uh, together with Tino in the, and the other expert, uh, able to deliver a lot of information in an easy way. Thank you very much again for participation, and we look forward to meet you again. Bye bye. All right. Thank you, Maru. Thank you. Everyone. Now we keep.